Um, sales pipeline, your commission checks lifeline. It's very important to make sure that you continue to, to do this activity. And it kind of sucks that I have to come up after those girls and Joseph because they were freaking amazing. Um, they took pretty much everything I was going to say. So we're going to make this go fast. Making sure that you have the correct lead sources and what you need to do. Um, so we're going to attack all of that. So one thing I want to point out is why we're all here. We're here to get what Craig says, butter, right? We all want to get better. Um, and every time you hear him talk, all I think about is butter. It's just so weird. And now I say butter instead of better. But anyways, I'm glad we all agree on that, by the way, because I'm not the only crazy person who says it. And I think that was Callens that pointed out the first time. My backstory. Um, so I opened, again, Scratch in 2007. Uh, about $7 million now. We've got two locations and 10 staff. A lot of people ask what the structure of that is. Um, so it's five sales, three CSRs. I have a full-time benefits guy in my office um, and a full-time life guy. So that was my answer to the ALR process that I process problem that I had inside of my agency um, for years and years and years. So I've been in the game 11 years. Um, I struggle with that. And it's just simply because of the EFS choices inside of our city. Um, we didn't have very many people to choose from, let alone now we have one guy. Um, I think he's 107 years old currently. So it doesn't exactly fit. Um, so we went this route. Um, also, co-owner of Follow-Up Tool, so Mark Mercer, myself, I'm the good-looking partner, um, created Follow-Up Tool in, 2000, uh, in April of last year, and then we merged companies with Lightspeed Voice. So we're one company. Um, I've enjoyed that process. My wife has not enjoyed it so much. So she, I always said that when, when I first opened in 2007, I'm glad I didn't know her because she would never have married me because you guys all know opening a business is awful. Um, and it's stressful and it takes away time from your family. Um, but she's been my rock and she, uh, she's my why. So Craig yesterday said that I was a good husband and father and I'm the one speaker who doesn't have a picture of his family. <laughs> so that makes me a father. Um, so, oh, speaking of that. So, so Becky drink, Becky, um, Becky got me this shirt. So, I'm going to do my best to not, but Becky just told me before I got up here that she's going to drink every time I cuss, so she's about to get drunk. <laughs> Anyways, so opportunities, um, the very first opportunity we're talking about, we're going to talk about every single opportunity, everything is different, not all of them are created equally, right? Some opportunities um, suck, and let's start with the first one. So, you know what these are. Um, in 2007, I started. This is how I built the business. This is what was legit back in 2007. Um, they have evolved into the same information being recycled, but they are a necessary activity, especially if you're starting scratch or, or you're trying to grow the book, um, of point of context. There's other opportunities out there around internet leads that are similar. And in particular, my goal in this presentation is for you to take something home that you can actually use. We use aged internet leads um, because it's essentially the same data that you're buying for $17. Um, I hope there's not a vendor in here. Sorry, guys. Um, but I buy for seven cents. And it's the exact same data. Just last year, I had an agent call me. He was pissed because we sold a policy that he was quoting, blah, blah, blah. And we didn't know that he was quoting it. Um, he wanted me to figure out if we were buying the same information. And I said, I don't buy leads. Um, but I looked through my data, and it was the same exact data information that I bought, but it was a list from 2015. So if they recycle them, that's what's going to happen. So if you can find an aged lead company and actually get those lists and just attack them, you're essentially getting the same data that's coming from the internet leads. If you do choose to use internet leads, it's cool. Just make sure you work the vendor and keep them accountable to what they told you they were going to do. Um, they have little weird magic dials inside that business because when you sign up, what do you get? You get good leads. Like you actually get a hold of people. And all of a sudden, as time goes on, the leads start to suck. So call them. And tell them you're about to leave, you're about to cancel your, your account, and then they will turn that magic dial, and all of a sudden you will start to get good leads again. And then when they start to suck again, you need to call them again. So that's your choice if you want to manage it like this. Um, but they are an opportunity, it's are something that is necessary to, to have activity. Second, live transfers. This is the opposite side of internet leads. Um, these people charge more money, and I use the two that are here, Datalot and, and BLeads. Um, they charge more money because they do the work for you. People will buy internet leads because they're six, seven, eight, nine, twelve dollars and say, oh, I'm not going to pay $35 for a live transfer, or $40, or $50, or $60, or whatever they cost. But essentially, you're, you're saving that money in labor costs because they're getting in contact with these people, and they're there ready for a quote. And a lot of these companies, 
give you the opportunity to use like a quote clock where you can disqualify the lead and not pay for it because we want to set up the perfect quoting opportunity each and every time. So if you can ask those necessary questions, then you're not paying for it and you continue to get more and more leads um, and more and more opportunities. So live transfers are, are key to us in our agency, um, but you have to maximize the opportunity we get on the phone with them. So we use this call scorecard, which I'm going to go over here in a little bit, but you have to make sure that you're having a value conversation because a lot of people out there ask me, um, how do you get away from that price conversation on a live transfer? Because that's how they're set up. Well, you get away from the price conversation. That's all you have to do. Every single thing when you question how do you do it, you just do it. And you do it to the best of your ability and you just control the conversation. The next thing is obvious, um, referrals. If I ask anyone out there, everyone will say that they need to get better with referrals. And inclu including myself. Um, there's zero reason that we can't ask for a referral on every single sales phone call. And there's zero reason we can't ask for a referral in every single positive conversation. Now, obviously, if there's a negative conversation, you don't want to bring it up. But if there's a positive conversation, you want to make sure you're asking the question. For us, how we do it, and you can try this, is you should have a piece of paper out. So you're not lying about this. And you say, look, I got two lines on my paper right now. I need help. I, I build my business off of great people like you. Can you give me two names right now? And I can call them right now. They're going to say yes because people want to help. Don't ask for a referral and say, I'm going to give you some $10 gift card. They don't care. Drink. Um, it, it doesn't matter to them. $10 gift cards don't matter. And that's the same thing similar to when we talk about this, the COIs. Um, Tolga yesterday talked about how mortgage people don't care about $25 gift cards, and it's true. And my whole COI spiel was stolen by Stephanie, so I'll just move on, I guess. Um, but we use the cutting boards, so we use that process as well. Um, I have a guy in my agency who's here, I told him I was gonna call him out, that came from the mortgage business, um, and he is awful about outbound phone calls. So like, I try to make sure that my team is getting the activity that they need. He's just hard-headed as hell, and he wouldn't make any phone calls, but he hit top tier in the agency because he was fed. So if you create those relationships and you show them value, and he didn't go and take them donuts. Let me, when you take a donut, like when you eat a donut, how do you feel? You feel guilty, right? Why do you wanna be responsible for someone feeling guilty? It's your name that just made them feel fat. You don't wanna do that. So don't take them a donut, because every time I eat a donut, I feel like So don't do that. Um, but Matt would go in there and he would just say, look, you know, I understand D to I, debt to income. I understand that you need a closing document in 30 minutes. Just know that when you call our agency, we're going to attack it instantaneously. There's no one else in front of you when you call. We're going to handle it. We're going to handle it right away. That's the value that they need. You need to sit down with them. And I love what Steph said about getting them out of their comfort zone, which we're going to try to do. Get them out of their comfort zone. Get them into your office and have a real conversation and just ask what's valuable to them. Because if you can do that, you're going to create the relationship and solidify it. And then, similar to what Tolga said, the milk run, staying in front of them constantly. They're going to forget about you if you allow them to forget about you. Mailers. So old school mailers um, seem to be making a comeback. I have a uh, best friend in Indianapolis um, that has built his entire agency off of mailers. He has like a, a sweatshop in his basement and he, he does it all himself. Um, and he literally burns through printers. He has three girls under four, so I don't blame him for hiding in his basement. I have one girl that's three, and she's a psychopath. So I can't imagine having three. So I don't blame him for hiding, so I totally get it. Um, but mailers are, are great, and, and we do some mailers in our agency. And, you know, the, the ROI is hard because you have to send a lot, and the, the, the percentage that calls back is not very good. But it keeps the staff happy. Like, they enjoy having that inbound phone call that has someone looking for a quote. They're always out there hunting. And then when someone calls in, it's just kind of a, a lay-down quoting process, and they can maximize it by using the scorecard. They love them. And we sell of them. So you can actually take advantage of those inbound phone calls as much as you can. Automation. Opened in 2007. They gave me a book called E-Myth. Um, it is about, I think they might still do this. It is about not wearing so many hats. Automation and technology allows you to not wear as many hats as you once had to do. Whether it's setting up an email or a text or a phone call or anything, you have to make sure you take advantage of all of this stuff. Calculating commissions with Zoom. All of this automation can make your life 100% easier. But you have to adapt and accept that you're going to have to use technology. Um, don't push back against technology. Take advantage of it. Accept it. Bring it into your agency. The stuff I'm doing now looks nothing like I did 11 years ago. And the stuff I'm doing in 10 years is going to look nothing like I'm doing now, I'm sure. But you want to make sure you continue to move forward. Stick, move, and adjust. 
Social media, a lot of you guys are here probably because of Facebook. Like, you guys are on Facebook, you're in Transform. Um, that's how you heard about certain stuff. We use Facebook um, during the quoting process pretty much every single time. So, a little story, Mike was one of my sales producers, was on the phone, and I heard him talking about Matt Kenseth, who's a NASCAR driver, I guess. I learned this that day. Um, there's not a single NASCAR fan in my office, but NASCAR's cool. He was talking to the staff about Matt Kenseth, and he was saying these facts that I have no idea how he knew, and I walked up behind him, and he was on the, the Prospects Facebook page because he looked up the phone number, and the Prospects Facebook page had Matt Kenseth in the cover photo, and the picture of Matt Kenseth as a profile picture, like on a shirt, and he related to that person by then Googling who the hell Matt Kenseth was and having conversations, and she was super excited that he loved Matt Kenseth as much as she did. So using social media will allow you to get to know your prospects faster and quicker than you can ever do it let alone sharing stuff on Facebook. Um, I see people say that they don't add their staff on Facebook and that's their personal life and stuff like that. that if that's your prerogative, that's cool. I wanna leverage it because I wanna recognize them. Our staff is the reason that we get to do stuff, right? Our staff is the reason we bonus. Our staff is the reason we get to go on trips. It's just facts. Um, you may hustle really hard and outsell them, but if you didn't have them, it wouldn't happen. So you gotta make sure you recognize them. I leverage it to make sure when they have a good day, I get to tag them and I get to tell everybody about how good they were because they deserve that. So if you don't use that, I'd highly suggest it. Requotes, winbacks, and cross sells. I put this all in here. I'm trying to get better about this. Like learning from CWC, um, I have 550,000 um, old leads. So I bought these over the 11 years. Again, I told you I buy aging air leads. And my company will scrub against prior lists. So I know they're all um, specifically a new lead every time I get it. But there's 550,000 of them. There's no reason I should be buying any more internet leads or data leads, but I continue to do so because I wanna see if I can get to a million. Just cuz. Um, but making sure you have an attack on requotes. If someone says no to a, uh, a quote right now, I mean a, a sale, you gotta make sure you have something set in place to follow up with them. Same thing with winbacks, same thing with cross outs. How we do winbacks inside of my agency is that we attack it the day that they leave. So if someone's leaving the agency today, I have an extra interview girl in my office. She's the only one that can terminate a policy. She'll go in there and make sure that she tries to you know, save the policy, but for whatever reason, they're usually leaving because of Bryce. We say, can we follow up with you? They say yes. She applies a plan to them. They get a text automatically in 20 business days that says, we miss you. We hope the transition went smooth. So we're not waiting for five months to talk, start talking to them. That's like sending your ex-girl a text and making sure the new dude is taking care of her, which no one does that, right? That'd be stupid. <laughs> but in this world, it works. And people respond all the time and say we, they appreciate it. So you're building the rapport for the future. And then, I don't know, like 80 days, we, 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 get, we send an email, a text, and then a phone call shows up. But you got to make sure you're working them because those are people that trusted you prior to, uh, at, compared to a requote who never trusted you. Essentially, when you sell a policy, you're earning trust. You're not buying, you're earning their business, you're earning their trust. So they already trusted you once. For whatever reason they left, you got to try to earn them back. Quoting and following up on these people. So you have all those opportunities um, to fill your pipeline. How are you gonna take advantage of actually doing it? Making the most out of your first phone call. This is where I think the value of CWC for my agency has changed the game. So for 10 and a half years, I, I, I did whatever the hell we were doing. I had nothing in process, right? I didn't know how we handled that first initial phone call. Then the scorecard came. So from January of 17 until July of 17, we wrote a whopping 14 umbrella policies. We led the state, which is sickening, but we wrote 14. Um, from August 1st until December, 7, or December of 17, we wrote 86. So it was the exact same people. It was just the way that they were talking to people. Using the scorecard will allow your staff to know exactly what to say. Now, how do you get them to do it? Like you can't just say, hey, here's a scorecard, do it, because I promise you it's not gonna happen. You have to make sure you have some process in place, and that includes work from you guys. So my life, is um, I have the agency, I have Fault Tool Light Speed, then I have a family, and I have two six-year-olds and a three-year-old and a wife. So there's like six hours of sleep in between all of that, and I ended up losing three hours of that sleep to listen to call recordings. So if you wanna coach your people, you gotta find time to listen to these calls and give feedback. How I made sure that they were on board is I invested 500 bucks. I did 10 $50 gift cards. I said, send me your best call of the day. So starting day one, terrible. And then, <laughs> sorry guys, they're bad. You guys sucked. But now it's incredible. So as the day progressed, um, not as the day, as the week progressed, the calls got better. And you know what? The calls went from six minutes 
to 45 minutes to 50 minutes because they were having better, more quality conversations and they started to close pups and umbrellas and multiple cars and, and all the other jazz. Um, so every day I gave away a $50 gift card. I didn't care if it was the same dude who won them every time. I had one guy who you literally would go box to box to box and that, that won because he was doing what I asked him to do. And now the conversation just rolls off the tongue. They know exactly what to say. They know how to introduce themselves. If you want to call a Geico or Progressive or whoever and ask for a quote, you're going to get a robotic order-taking response. If you call my agency, you better, you better get, we should call and try right now. Um, you better get a, an appreciative response to a quote and saying thank you for the opportunity and then building rapport and collecting data through a different way instead of just saying what's your name, what's your address, what's your date of birth. You need to make sure you build up that rapport so they trust you. And like Beth had mentioned up here, if you don't get the sale, something broke down in that scorecard process. So something was missed in the conversation that you got to make sure you can attack. Controlling the follow-up inside your agency, you need to set the expectation with your staff. So making sure that you, if, I mean, you're the boss, right? Your name's on the door. Take feedback from your staff and take, take advice and ideas. But if you want a phone call on a certain day, it better happen. If you want a text or an email to go on a certain day, it better happen. If you want them to get out of the office on a certain day, it needs to happen. So figure out a process in your agency to make sure it's happening. And if it's not happening, have a conversation immediately. Don't let it go for weeks on weeks and then try to fix it. You need to make sure it's attacked right away. Being intentional and precise. When I say intentional, um, we're super intentional. So if we send a text, we have something called a lunch date text. It sends a text at 10 a.m. And we want to ask them if they have a lunch date. And if they don't have a lunch date, we want to set up a time to take them to lunch over the phone. Because they could, could be anywhere. But actually be intentional with that text and, and have a goal in mind. Obviously, we want to sell as much as we can, but every single task needs to be intentional and you need to make sure you're doing it like you want to do it. Don't sway from the process. Um, this is more has to do with the scorecard. I continue and continue and continue to, to ram this home in their head because if you sway from it just because you think this person's in a hurry or whatever the reason is, it's going to screw up the entire process. Just stick to the card, stick to the process that you have built in your side of your agency, and if you don't, and, I mean, if you do, then you, you, you can't blame anything, right? You did your job, you move on to the next one. But if you, if you continue to do that, you can find success. Utilizing all forms of communication I already touched on, buy or die. So here's the story. So we called a guy 281 times. Um, then we sold him on call 281. So Roger was the guy's name, and then the wife was something, I don't remember. Um, so Roger was our objection. He didn't want to come over, but Mike continued to call. 280 times. 280 first time comes up, he calls him, Roger dies. Because Roger was the objection, now the wife bought. So that's a different scenario, <laughs> but it was good. I mean, I feel bad for Roger or the wife, but you're either going to buy or die. You're either going to buy or tell us to die, one or the other. So it's just a matter of making sure you continue to follow up. Don't give up. There's no reason to stop calling. Um, what does your recall process we look like and number of touches to close the deal? Inside a follow-up tool for us, we, and in our agency, we were doing this prior, we were tracking number of touches. Salespeople need to know that people don't just close on two touches. You've got to continue to follow up with them over and over and over again. If you don't, you're just leaving them out there to, to die by themselves, not literally. But you've got to make sure you continue to follow up because the number of touches can average five, it can average seven. The, the, the strength of your salesperson um, could be very high and you could average two or three. But there are deals that take 10, 12, 281. Whatever it is, people continue to follow up, you're going to eventually get them. Truth through activity. This is kind of my saying. Um, whatever you say you want to do, um, what you do is what your truth is. So if you say you want to lose weight and then we eat donuts in the morning, um, you're not exactly telling yourself the truth. My staff will tell you, I will ask them, why are you lying to me? So I say that to their face. Because if they say they want to hit top tier and then they play on Twitter all day or Facebook and they're talking and they're not doing their work, they're lying about what they want. Um, why are you lying is, is the best statement you can say when you're talking about goals. If you write down goals and you don't attack them and you, you, every single action doesn't lead to that goal, you're lying to yourself about what you actually want. The four things that we focus on inside of my agency is body, being, balance, and business. It's four Bs. So I got it from an entrepreneurship group that I joined a couple years ago. I asked them in December or January um, what their goals were. And I gave them a journal. And I said, you know, these are the four things I focus on quarterly. And you can focus on this. You can focus on anything you want. Just write down something that you want me to hold you accountable to. It can be eating healthy. It could be debt. It could be business goals. It could be family goals. And then every week we sit down and we talk about them. 
Because if you tell me that you want to lose 15 pounds, and I sit down with you on journal day, and I say, what'd you eat today? And it was pizza. Why are you f***ing lying? Um, I eat pizza too. I get it. Um, but if you want to pay off debt, and you, didn't, you haven't put any money towards it, or any money to the side for it, and it's, again, why, why are you telling me you want to do this, but then you're not taking action against it? One guy said that he wanted to be a, a better husband. Um, so by having that conversation with him, I am now growing as a better husband. So I'm able to have these conversations. It was a 45 minute conversation with James about being a better husband and what he can do. Um, all of us, if we have all four key areas dialed in, we can be better at business. If we're better on the balance side where our home is better, um, we're better. If we're better on body where we're healthy and strong, we're going to perform better. If we're better in our spiritual being, we're better. And then we're better in business. So if you can focus on all of those, we can. My biggest takeaway from this entire conference was something that was set off to the side by Scott. And he said, I was practicing this in my room, and I like started talking. I'm like, I'm going to cry. Um, it's all right. He said, he was talking about his kids, and he said, you know, that phone is in front of you, and sometimes you just need to put the phone down. And like, he's like, awkwardly, just stare at them. But they grow up so fast, and I am awful about it. I'm home, and I'm not present, and now I need to realize how much I need to work on that. And I'm going to get rid of my phone. And I, I have to commit to doing that. And if I'm not, I told my wife this, if I have my phone out, you need to call me a liar and tell me to put down my phone. Because I'm going to put it down and I'll stare at him. Because it's not important. It is not important when you're at home. What's home is important. And then if your home is dialed in, your business can then expand and grow faster than you want it to do. Um, would your kids be proud? So Craig mentioned this the first day. And I try to say this to them. Um, but it's more reflective for me. So if your kids were standing next to you at your desk, would they be proud of the actions and the activity that you're doing that day to, to take home to them? Um, I go to work and I think to myself, I'd rather be home with my kids. But then if I go to work and I'm playing on Facebook or Twitter or I'm wasting time, I should be spending that time with my kids. I'm like, what am I doing? Um, ask that question to your staff. Or, would your kids be proud or would your spouse or your girlfriend or your boyfriend or whatever? in what you're doing today. Because if they're not, you need to adjust. You need to get back to discipline and you need to focus on what you need to focus on. You're only at work from eight to five. It's not that hard. Some aliens like Beth can do it like I've never seen before. <laughs> Alien is the perfect description. It's incredible what she can do. And I sent my staff all to the, the, the workshop and they all came back with the one thing that I've been preaching to them for 11 years. And for some reason they go down there for eight hours and everything just clicks, which just pisses me off. Oh, yeah, I need activity. No, <laughs> what the have I been saying? Well, Beth only came out of her office two times to pee. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Makes me so mad. Anyways, um, I'm still pissed about that. So, anyways, so um, why do you want and who do you want it? Or what do you want? If you ask your staff what they want, if they don't do what they say they want, then you ask them why they're lying. Why do they want it? Figure out what the reason is. Everybody's talked about what their why is up here. My why is, is financial freedom, to be with my kids. Everyone will point to their kids, but the real why is to get financially free so I can actually be with them when I want to be with them. Um, I won't sugarcoat it and say it's just my kids. If I can get that financial freedom, then I have the choices to make where I can go coach everything, which I want to do. My two boys, I want to coach every single sport I can. Um, but if I don't build the business and set it up to be that way, then I can't do it. Ask your staff the same thing. What is their overall goal? I had a staff who, you know, I, I, I could tell something was up, and he said he wanted to be an electrician. Um, so I called every single electrician company I knew to try to get him a job because I want them to be doing what they want to do. If you have a staff person that's not bought in or they don't want to be doing it, help them. Our goal is mentorship. That's what we are. We, need to, we, we hold them accountable. We're their mentors and we're their leaders. I bought into uh, CWC mentorship program because I need accountability for myself. As agency owners, it's hard to find accountability for ourselves. Um, it's usually our bank or our, our wife. But other than that, there's nothing really there. So to have a mentor like Craig who can call me on my and say, why are you doing this and why are you doing that? That's what I needed. So find out what you need and then either invest in it or find it somewhere else. Finally, the next slide is going to be um, a video. It's two minutes long. So we're all going to sit here for two minutes till my time's up. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Joseph's looking at me like, what? Um, so this video is called Good, okay? This is a uh, podcast guy named Jocko. And uh, three weeks ago, I was in the hospital 
because I couldn't breathe during basketball. And they told me I had like blood clots in my lungs. My pastor came and prayed with me, which is kind of freaky. Um, and uh, it ended up being all good. But I got a text from one of my staff because I send this video all the time. And he said, you have blood clots in your lungs. Good. That means God told you to slow down. So finding good in every single aspect of everything is there. And that's what this video is for. Um, so it'll actually show you what oh I mean my. by that. See? So I mean, just being good. Um, focusing on that's important. He has a book called Discipline, is, uh, Discipline Equals Freedom, which I would write that down and I would buy it because it's a very, very easy read and it's very, very truthful. Um, Discipline Equals Freedom. It's legit. So um, buy it, read it, and you can, it's, it's like excerpt version. So like you can read a page and have a takeaway thought for that day. You don't need to read the whole thing. I don't think it's like 70 pages long, um, but it's legit. So thank y'all for allowing me to get up here.